بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Then Al-Imam Muslim said كتاب الصلاة The book of the Salah Salah in the language of the Arab means dua and in the technical terminology it is an act of devotion or worship to Allah Jalla wa ala, which begins with a takbir, ends in a taslim and it involves the well-known actions and statements The first chapter the Shaykh begins with is the Babu Bad il Adhan the chapter of the beginning of the Adhan The Adhan in the Arabic language means I'lam or when you announce something as in the statement of Allah وَأَذَانُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولُهُ And an Adhan or a declaration from Allah and His Messenger to mankind on the greatest day of Hajj meaning the 10th of the Al-Hijjah, that Allah and His Messenger are free of the Mushrikeen. And technically it is the announcing of the entry of the prayer time. And of course it can only be given after the timing of the prayer begins. The Adhan was made fard on the 2nd of the Hijri year. Abdullah ibn Zayd and Umar ibn al-Khattab, they saw in a dream how to say the Adhan and they reported it to the Prophet and the Prophet acknowledged his dream. He said that this is a righteous or a true dream. As for the Nasara, they would announce their worship with bells and the Yahud would do it using horns and the Muslims wanted to differ from them. So Allah Jalla wa Ala gave us the better way to call to the Adhan and of course the human voice is the most interesting sound to listen to. Let's take a look at this first narration, Hadith 191, Abdullah ibn Umar says, When the Muslims first came to Al-Madinah, they would gather together and wait for the prayer. But nobody would announce the prayer time or call for it. And so they discussed this matter one day. Some of them said that we should take bells, just like the Nasara take the bells. Some others said maybe we should take the horns, just like the Yahud take the horns to announce their salah. And at this point, Umar radiallahu an, he said, Why don't you send a person? He will call with his voice for the prayer. And so upon this, the Prophet والسلام, said, Ya Bilal, qum fanadi bis salah. O Bilal, stand up and call for the prayer. So we find from this hadith then that Bilal must have been the first person to make the call for the prayer, the adhan. The call for the prayer is made after the time enters, except Bilal would make the Adhan before the Salat al-Fajr and then another Adhan would be made after the timing of Salat al-Fajr had begun So why was this? Well the first Adhan was not the Adhan for Salat al-Fajr because you cannot have the Adhan before the time begins Rather that first Adhan was simply as the Prophet says to wake up the one who is sleeping so that he can get ready for the Salah and also for the one who is fasting so he can eat his Sahur and then come for the Salat al-Fajr so that first Adhan was more like a preparation for the people. Note here as well a very important lesson which is to consult the people. Here we have the Prophet consulting the people as to what to do with the announcing of the prayer. He didn't have to. He would have thought that Allah Jalla wa would simply tell him. So why would the Prophet consult with the people? Well he would consult with the people to teach us that this is the way the Muslims work. They consult with each other. Plenty of evidence in the Quran. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Those who answer the call of their Lord and they establish the prayer and their matter is decided by consultation between them and they spend out of what we have provided them. Meaning giving in charity. Furthermore, a specific Order given to the Prophet, Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the Quran, وَشَّاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ And consult them in your affairs. So if the Prophet is obliged to consult his companion, and he's the Prophet, he could simply dictate everything he wants, but he is obliged to consult the people, then what about our case? We are even more so obliged to consult our fellow people. And so this must take place in all affairs, in political affairs, in social affairs, in marital affairs between the husband and the wife. All types of affairs you can think of, consultation is the way the Muslim works. Now, authentically in the Sunan, Abdullah ibn Zayd saw in his dream the actual words of the Adhan. And he narrated it to the Prophet and the Prophet acknowledged this as a true dream and told him to teach Bilal these words. So how does that narration square up with this one in Sahih Muslim? 
And the answer is these are two different occasions. The occasion here in Sahih Muslim is the first occasion of calling out for the prayer. Now this means that this adhan, quote unquote, would not have been the official adhan that you are familiar with. It would have simply have been just informing people of the prayer. Something like, the prayer has started, or something along those lines. But then thereafter, Abdullah ibn Zayd saw in his dream the exact words and narrated it to the Prophet. And the Prophet told him to teach Bilal because he was calling for the prayer as it was, because he had a nice booming voice. We may also take that it is legislated to oppose the Yahud and Nasara in that which is specific to them. And from those matters is the call to the Salah. Okay, when was the Adhan first made? So in this narration, which we have just mentioned, when did it take place? Well, the best that can be said here is that it took place during the Medina period. Because in the narration, you see them talking about the Yahud. And the Yahud were living in and around al Medina. So we may say it was shortly after the Hijrah. Did the Prophet make the Adhan himself ever? Well, we have no authentic evidence which tells us that the Prophet himself made the Adhan. Can women make the Adhan and the Iqamah? The answer is if they are amongst themselves and praying in the Jama'ah, then yes, they can make the Adhan and the Iqamah just like anyone else because there's no evidence to suggest that they cannot. Is it wajib upon them? The answer is no, it is not wajib upon them as it is wajib upon the men. So the matter is more flexible for the women. As for the men, it is wajib upon them. Al-Bayhaqi reports a hadith Laysa ala nisa'i adhanun wala iqama The adhan and the iqama are not wajib upon the women. Some have graded this to be mawquf, but even if we say it is marfu' it would mean that it is not obligatory but that does not mean that they are not allowed to make the adhan and the iqama. So ponder over this. Do you have to make the adhan and the iqama if praying alone? It is better if you do so. However, you do not need to. If you're living in a city, then the adhan is for the kifaya. As long as somebody has made it in the locality in which you are living in, then you do not need to do it. But if you do it, it is better. As for the iqama, this would be more emphasized than the adhan. Again, many scholars say you do not need to do it, but it is better to do so if you are praying alone. Similarly, what about if a person comes to the masjid late and the prayer has finished? Can he, or maybe some others with him, make the adhan and the iqama? Again, the better way is yes, but if they suffice themselves with the adhan of the first mu'addin, then that is absolutely fine. However, as for the iqama, then from the statements of the scholars, it appears that this is more emphasized for every salah, more so than the adhan. That just needs to be given once, if we take the lenient opinion, and that once would suffice for everyone else in that particular locality, because it is fard kifaya, whereas the iqama is for every salah. So generally speaking, for the single person, the iqama is more emphasized than the adhan. Though if he does both, then that is better, and Allah knows best. Hadith 192, the statement of Anas radiallahu an, he says that Bilal radiallahu an was ordered to make the adhan even and to make the iqama witr. The hadith of Abdullah ibn Zayd in Sunan al-Tirmidhi tells us how this is to be done. The takbir of Allahu Akbar is said four times, then ashadu an la ilaha illallah twice, then ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah twice, hayya ala salah twice, hayya ala al-falah twice, then the takbir twice and la ilaha illallah. This is evens. As for the iqama, also mentioned in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Zayd, it is half of the adhan. So in the beginning, Allahu Akbar twice. Then ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah, qad qamat al-salat, qad qamat al-salah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. So the final takbir is twice, but the one in the beginning is half of the first, which is twice. So even though the takbirat are twice, which is even, but it is half of the adhan. So it is odd with respects to the adhan. So if one is half of two, so the iqama is half of the adhan. So it's odd with respects to the adhan. And this is the majority opinion. There are other opinions that they say 
everything is to be said once except the qadqamat al salah which is to be said twice also with the adhan we have the narration from abu mahdhura the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi taught him at tarji' which is simply to repeat the shahadatain to yourself twice in a low voice and then to call it out aloud so you say quietly to yourself ashhadu an la ilaha illallah ashhadu an la ilaha illallah ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah this is quietly to yourself and then afterwards you say this out aloud as normal and so this is also a sunnah which the prophet taught abu mahdhura one of his muaddin other version of the adhan the takbir at the beginning is said twice instead of four times and all of this is acceptable Okay, what is the reason for the difference? And the reason is because the adhan is for those people who are not present, whereas the iqama is for those people who are present. And for this reason also, the adhan should be made from a high place, so it reaches a further audience, as opposed to the iqama. Hadith 193 about the description of the adhan from Abu Mahdura that the Prophet والسلام, taught him the adhan, and it says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And all of that, the shahadatain meaning, he says quietly to himself and then he repeats it twice each again, meaning the two shahadatain. And then after that, Hayy ala al salah twice and Hayy ala al falah twice. And then, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. And this is the narration. We find in this narration then that the sentences which you utter are 17 in total. This is with the tarjir and the takbir only twice at the beginning. As for if you were to make tarjir and the takbir four times in the beginning, then this would make 19 sentences, two more. And both of these are permissible. And the one you're most likely to hear is the adhan without the tarjir and four takbirat at the beginning. So this makes 15 sentences. As for the iqama, the one you're most likely to hear is the one with 11 sentences. However, if you made the takbir just once instead of twice and with the qadqamat salah twice as usual, then you could end up with nine sentences in the iqama. So it would be Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala falah, qadqamat salah wa qadqamat salah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Nine sentences, and this is also permissible. We also have the matter of at tathweeb which means to say, as salatu khayrun min al -nawm. And you say this in the salatu subh adhan. And it is said after, hayy ala al falah. And you say it twice. Because this is what was taught to Abdullah ibn Zayd in his dream. And we must say this is recommended on account of the fact that the Prophet did not teach this to Abu Mahdhura in this narration. But in any case, one ought to say it. Okay, let's talk about some of the mistakes that are made in the Adhan. So from the mistakes that number one, to say Allahu Akbar instead of Allahu Akbar, because Akbar means drums. Likewise to say Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. That's a mistake. It needs to be Ashhadu because otherwise it becomes a question format. Also to stop at Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. It needs to be in one go. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Because you are not testifying that there is no deity. Also from the mistakes, to say Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. You see how the dal and the ra, you make idgham, so you join them on. This is not to be done. It is grammatically incorrect. It needs to be Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. So the two letters are distinct. Also, you need to say Hayya ala salah. You need to pronounce a ha at the end. As in not doing so, it will be calling people to the fire in terms of the meaning. But at the same time, it is not Hayya ala salah because salah means righteousness. So it's not the ha sound, but more of the softer ha sound. And these were some of the mistakes as pointed out by Ibn al-Mulaqqan rahimahullah. Hadith 194 from Ibn Umar, he says, كَانَ لِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم مؤذناني بلال وابن أم مكتوم الأعمى 
he says that the Prophet had two Mu'addin, one was Bilal and the other one was Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the blind man. So these two Mu'addinan, they were taking turns to give the Adhan. And so you don't have two Mu'addinan giving the Adhan for one Salah, so two Adhans for one Salah, no, that's not right. Rather, it is one Adhan for one Salah, but they could take it in turns. And so we can say then, that in one masjid, you are allowed to have two fixed mu'adhinan. So they could take in turns to give the adhan. So one says the adhan for Salat al-Subh, the other one for Salat al-Dhuhr, and so on. There is another mu'adhin the Prophet had, Abu Mahdura, but he would not have been in the same masjid as the other two, taking in turns. Abu Mahdura was the mu'adhin for the Prophet in Mecca. Also, notice how Ibn Umar said that Ibn Umm Maktoum is Al-A'ma, the blind. That's clearly a defect. And people do not wish to be addressed in a form of a defect. So is this backbiting? The answer is no. Because you have to address him in this way so that people may know whom you're talking about. So this is for ta'arif. And it is a genuine need. Backbiting is not a genuine need. So notice the difference. Allah Jalla wa ala also refers to him in the same way. Abasa wa tawalla. But this is as a ta'rif, it is not a tanaqqus, meaning it is not to defame his character. Hadith 195, the statement of Aisha, she says that Ibn Umm Maktoum used to give the adhan for the Prophet and he was blind. And so this narration shows that a blind person can give the adhan and there's no problem with this. Of course, the only issue is that the blind person would have to be told that the prayer time has entered because the blind person will not be able to see the position of the sun so as to tell whether the prayer time has begun. It is not necessary that the one who gives the adhan also give the iqama. However, it is preferred because that way you have some consistency and so one person knows that it's his job to give the adhan and the iqama and there's no confusion so it's better that way. However, we cannot say it is a condition for you to give the iqama that you should have given the adhan. Rather, the only issue is that it must be given. This is the fard kifaya. And the adhan and the iqama are fard kifaya upon the men. Notice that the adhan and the iqama are only legislated for the five daily salawat. They are not legislated for other than that. For example, the nawafil salah, or the salat al-kusuf, or the salat al-istisqa, or the salat al janaza Number 196. From Anas ibn Malik, he says that when the Prophet ﷺ wanted to invade a particular land, he would wait until the dawn broke and he would listen out for the Adhan. If he heard the Adhan being given, he would not invade the land, otherwise he would invade. And so one day he heard a man giving the Adhan, saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And in response to this takbir which he was making, the Prophet said, Al al fitrah he is upon the fitrah. And then when the Mu'addin said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, twice, the Prophet replied, Kharajta min an nar you have exited the fire. And they saw who is this Mu'addin, and it was a shepherd. So from this hadith then, we can take that even if you're alone, you can give the adhan, and it is recommended to do so, not wajib. It is wajib when you're in a community. Also, it is not wajib to repeat after the Mu'addin whatever he says, rather it is recommended because in this narration here, the Prophet ﷺ did not repeat after the Mu'addin. Rather, he said some other words like Al al fitra upon the fitra, because every human is born upon this fitra of La ilaha illallah, one true unique creator deity. As for when he says Kharajta min al nar you have exited the fire, then yes, Tawheed will save you from the fire. The Certainty and belief in La ilaha illallah will save you from the fire. Hadith 197 from Amr ibn al As. He heard the Prophet say, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمُ الْمُؤَذِّنِ فَقُولُوا مِثْلَ مَا يَقُولُ ثُمَّ صَلُّوا عَلَيَّ فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيَّ صَلَاةً صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ بِهَا عَشْرًا ثُمَّ سَلُوا اللَّهَ لِي الْوَسِيلَ فَإِنَّهَا مَنْزِلَةٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ لا تنبغي لعبد من عباد الله وأرجو أن أكون أنه فمن سأل لي الوسيلة حلت عليه الشفاعة 
The Prophet said, when you hear the Mu'addin, then say as he says. Then send your salah upon me, because whoever sends his salah upon me, then Allah sends his salah upon that person tenfold. And then afterwards, ask Allah to grant me al-wasila, because this is a place or a station in Jannah, only fitting for one slave from the slaves of Allah, and I hope that would be me. So whoever asks for al-wasila for me, then the shafa'ah or the intercession becomes halal for him, meaning the Prophet would definitely intercede for you. The order is given here. To repeat after the Mu'addin, we have already said that this order is denoting a recommendation, not obligation. Because from the other narration, the Prophet did not repeat as the Mu'addin said. Also, this applies to the Adhan of the Salat al-Subh, in which it is narrated, the Prophet ordered that it should be said, As-Salatu Khayrun Min al nawm after the Hayy ala salah and that is said twice. So you repeat that as well in the Adhan of the Salat al-Subh. From the generality of this narration, it appears that when the Mu'addin says Hayy ala salah and Hayy ala al-Falah, you repeat these words. However, in another narration, in the same chapter, in the book of Muslim, the Prophet details out what you should say, and indeed, after every sentence, you repeat what the Mu'addin says, except that in the other narration, the Prophet said that after the Hayy ala salah and Hayy ala al-Falah, you should say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So we find that you do not repeat those words, Hayy ala salah and Hayy ala al-Falah. And the Prophet says, whoever repeats after the Mu'addin from his heart will enter Jannah. So you repeat after the Mu'addin, not just giving it the lip service, but with real conviction and belief. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah means there is no movement from one place to the other, nor there is any strength except by the permission of Allah. And it is said during times when you feel helpless. And it is fitting to be said here in the Adhan because when the Mu'addin says Hayy ala salah, come to the salah, then you're realizing that it is impossible to come to the salah because you cannot move from one place to the other, nor have the strength to move except by the permission of Allah. And in another narration in the chapter, the Prophet gave a legislated dhikr for after the Adhan from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. The Prophet said, Man qala hina yasma'u al-mu'addin أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله رضيت بالله ربا وبمحمد رسولا وبالإسلام دينا غفر له ذنبه Whoever says when he hears the Mu'addin I testify there is no true God except Allah alone and that Muhammad is his servant and messenger I am happy or pleased with Allah as a Lord and with Muhammad as the messenger and with Islam as the deen then if he says that, the Prophet says, his sins will be forgiven. As for the other dua to be said, asking the Prophet for the wasila, then the legislated dua, which has been reported, can be found in any good dua book. Note here that if you hear the adhan from a record player, then it is not legislated to repeat after the mu'addin, because it's not the mu'addin who is giving the adhan here, it's simply the record player. Okay, does the same rule apply for the iqama? The answer is yes. As for when the Muqeem says, قَدْ أَقَامَتِ الصَّلَاةِ Then you repeat those words. You do not say, أَقَامَهَ اللَّهُ وَأَدَامَهَا May Allah establish it and keep it going, because that is from a weak hadith. Hadith 198 from Muawiyah. He says that the Prophet says, الْمُؤَذِّنُونَ أَطْوَلُ النَّاسِ أَعْنَاقًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ The Mu'addinun will have the longest necks out of everyone on يوم القيامة. This is a virtue of the Mu'addinun, even though having a long neck in this world would be seen as a defect. But the afterlife cannot be compared to this life. And so this is a virtue of the Mu'addinun, something which the others would envy the Mu'addinun for. And so in this, there is an encouragement for the people to give adhan. If it is so virtuous, then you might ask, why didn't the major companions give the adhan? Like Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. Well, we say they had more important and pressing needs to attend to. Remember, they were khulafa, and so they would have been extremely busy. And as for the mu'addin, remember, you need to stay and watch the position of the sun, and then you can give the adhan. And this requires some dedication. And of course, this is precious time which the khulafa could not afford to miss out on. Hadith number 199 from Abu Huraira, the Prophet ﷺ said, 
إن الشيطان إذا سمع النداء بالصلاة أحال له ضراط حتى لا يسمع صوته فإذا سكت رجع فوسوس فإذا سمع الإقامة ذهب حتى لا يسمع صوته فإذا سكت رجع فوسوس He says that when the shaytan hears the adhan or the call for the prayer he runs away or escapes from it and he passes loud wind so that he cannot hear the voice or the adhan and when the muadhin is quiet he returns back and he whispers into the people as he normally does of course and then when the iqama is given he again goes away so that he cannot hear the voice and then when the muadhin stops the iqama the shaytan returns and starts his waswasa again and so in this hadith there is a fadila or a virtue for the adhan in that the shaytan escapes away from a place in which the adhan is given it's the same with surah al-baqarah of course the shaytan runs away from a house in which surah al-baqarah is recited and we can say that any time you make a dhikr of allah jalla wa ala, the shaytan moves away from you or feels averse to you and so a dhikr of allah is a great protection against the shaytan and his whispers and in another wording of the hadith in the same chapter the prophet says that he comes back and he whispers into the people he whispers into the person remember such and such or remember such and such which he was not remembering before until the man who is in the prayer forgets how much he has prayed as for if somebody has a lot of waswasa in the salah and he's unable to focus in the salah then obviously this needs to be fought against and it requires much striving of course however it does not break the prayer hadith 200 this is about raising the hands in your prayer from ibn umar he says that the prophet when he would stand in the prayer he would raise both his hands until they were up to the shoulder blade level and then he would make takbir and when he wanted to make a ruku' he would do something similar meaning the raising the hands and the takbir and when he wanted to rise from the ruku' he would do similar and he did not used to do this when he would raise his head from the sujood so in this narration we are told three places where you raise the hands and one place where you do not raise the hand as for raising of the hands then this is an ibadah of the hands as some of the scholars have said also we can say it is to beautify or adorn the prayer we find from this narration that you raise the hands to the shoulder blade level some other narrations talk about to the earlobe level so it seems there's flexibility there what's apparent from the narration is that you raise your hands first and then say the takbir at the beginning because it says he raised his hands until they were his shoulder blades level and then he made takbir however the issue appears to be flexible so even if you do it at the same time there wouldn't be a problem and if you made takbir first and then the raising of the hands again it wouldn't be a problem the main issue is that the takbir must be said this is the rukun of the salah as for the raising of the hands then this is a sunnah and so even if you did not raise the hands your prayer would still be valid the three places where you raise your hands at the beginning of the prayer as you go into the ruku and as you stand up from the ruku in fact we have evidence for a fourth place as well it is when you stand up from the first tashahud so when you get up then for the third rakah you raise your hands likewise and that's also in the sahih so in all four of these positions when you raise your hands you are in a standing position as for how high up the hands are raised you can raise them up to the shoulder blade level and we have evidence for that and you can also raise them up to the ears and we have evidence for that what you are not to do is to raise them beneath the shoulder blade level or raise them above the level of the ears because that is extreme and not the sunnah hadith 201 abu salama ibn abdurrahman says that abu huraira used to pray in front of the people and he would make takbir every time he would lower himself in the prayer or raise himself from the prayer and when he finished he would say Wallahi inni la ashbahukum salatan bi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Allah out of all of you my prayer resembles the prophet's prayer the most and also in another narration in the same chapter from Abu Huraira he says that the prophet when he stood up to pray he would make the takbir then when he would go into ruku' he would make takbir 
And when he would rise from the ruku' he would say Sami Allahu liman hamida as he was raising himself. And then when he has stood up straight, he would say Rabbana walakal hamd. And then he would make takbir and go into the sajda. And he would make takbir and raise himself from the sajda. Then he would make takbir again and go into the second sajda. And then he would make takbir when he would raise his head. And he would do that in his salah until his death. And he would also make the takbir when he would rise from the first tashahud. So this narration is telling us about when to make the takbiratul intiqal, the takbir of when you move from one position to the other. It is done in between the positions, so in between the standing and the ruku' position. It is not done in the standing position or in the ruku' position, but rather in between. And likewise with all other positions, the takbiratul intiqal is done in between. So as you are moving from one position to the other. When Abu Huraira says that my prayer resembles the Prophet's prayer the most out of all of you, is he praising himself? Similarly, when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that there is not a single ayah in the Qur'an except I know when and where it was revealed, and if there was anyone who knows more than me that I could write to, I would certainly write to him. Then is ibn Mas'ud praising himself and praising his own knowledge? Well, the answer to both of these scenarios is no. These companions are not praising themselves, rather their intention needs to be looked at here. Both of these companions are saying that we know what we are talking about and how to worship properly, so learn from us. Abu Huraira is saying, learn your prayer from me because I know what I'm talking about. And Ibn Mas'ud is saying, learn your tafsir from me because I know what I'm talking about, as opposed to other people who may not have full and proper knowledge. So with this type of intention then, you are allowed to say things which would seem to be praising yourself. Hadith 202 from Ubadah ibn Samit, the Prophet said, لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب There is no salah for the one who does not recite the Fatiha of the book. The Fatiha is also called the Ummul Qur'an, the main or the choicest part of the Qur'an because Al-Fatiha contains the whole essence of the Qur'an. It contains Tawheed, all the three types of Tawheed of course, Rububiyyah, Uluhiyyah and Asma wa Sifat. And it makes a dua to guide us to the straight path. And this is the whole essence of the Qur'an. إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ Verily, this Qur'an guides to that which is most upright. And in Al-Fatiha, you're exactly asking for this. Guidance to that which is most upright. So it captures the whole essence of the Qur'an. When the Prophet says here, La salah, no salah, then it means your salah is invalid. So it's as if you have not prayed. And from this it becomes known that the Al-Fatiha is a rukun of the salah. You absolutely must perform it. Hadith 203 from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, "Man salla salatan lam yaqra fiha bi umm al Quran, fahiya khidaj." Whoever prays and he does not recite the umm al Quran, then it is cut off or deficient, meaning the prayer is. And the Prophet said this three times. And Abu Huraira was asked, "But what if you are behind the Imam?" And then Abu Huraira replied. اقرأ بها في نفسك Recite it to your own self Because I heard the Prophet say قال الله تعالى قسمت الصلاة بيني وبين عبدي نصفين ولعبدي ما سأل That Allah says that I have divided the salah between myself and my slave half each and for my slave is what he demands فإذا قال العبد الحمد لله رب العالمين قال الله تعالى حمدني عبدي so when the slave says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah replies, My servant has praised me. وَإِذَا قَالَ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ And when he says, الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى أَثْنَ عَلَيَّ عَبْدِي Allah replies by saying, My servant has repeatedly praised me. فَإِذَا قَالَ مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ And when the servant says, Owner of the Day of Judgment, قَالَ مَجَدَنِي عَبْدِي Allah replies, my servant has extolled me. And once he said that my servant has left the affair up to me. When the servant says, you alone we worship and you alone we seek help. Allah replies that this sentence is between me and my servant. And for my servant is whatever he asks. فَإِذَا قَالَ إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ And then when the servant says this last part of Al-Fatiha, 
Guide us to the straight path, the path of those you have favoured, not of those whom you are angry with, nor those gone astray. Allah replies by saying that this part is for my servant and my servant will have what he asks for. This hadith pertains to when you are praying behind the Imam and the Imam is reciting Al-Fatiha. Do you recite as well? According to this hadith, you do. Because this is the opinion of Abu Huraira. And this is an issue in which there is much dispute because others reply by saying that when the Imam is reciting and when you're listening to the Quran, of course you have to keep quiet. And likewise, when you say Ameen, then this counts as you having made this Dua so that you don't actually need to recite the Fatiha in the first place. And if you do recite the Fatiha, then what's the point in Imam reciting it when you're not listening to him? And just using plain rationale, this opinion makes more sense than the opinion which says that you must recite the Fatiha. However, we do have an authentic hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood in which the Prophet heard the companions reciting behind him and he asked, are you reciting behind me? And they said yes, and he replied to them by saying, لا تفعلوا إلا بأم القرآن فإنه لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بها Don't recite behind me except for the Umm Al-Quran, the Fatiha because there is no prayer for the one who does not recite it. So this seems to be the decisive hadith which would favor the opinion that you do recite behind the Imam even if he is reciting out aloud and that this would be an exception to the general rule which tells you that you must listen to the Imam. This narration also proves that the Basmala is not part of Al-Fatiha because otherwise it would have been mentioned and that appears to be the weightier opinion and Al-Fatiha is seven ayat, we know that and this could be divided up three for Allah, one is neutral and the last three are for the servant so Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, number one Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, two Malik Yawm Deen, three and these are praising Allah, therefore Allah this is neutral. This is both for Allah and for the servant. Because the servant worships Allah and this is Allah's right. But he also seeks help from Allah. So this is where the servant benefits. So this ayah is shared both ways. Then the last three ayat. That's the fifth one. That's the sixth. That's the seventh. So these last three are for the servant. He is seeking guidance and he is seeking to differ from the Yahud and the Nasara. As for the recital out aloud, then there is an ijma' of the Ummah. In the two rak'at of the Subh, the first two rak'at of the Maghrib and the first two of the Isha, the rest are silently done. This idea of reciting out aloud or quietly is a matter of recommendation. It is not a matter of obligation. So if the Imam does not recite out aloud in the Maghrib Salah, for example, then there is no such that sahu on anyone, because this is a recommendation, not an obligation. Okay, what if someone says that you do not need to recite Al-Fatiha, you can recite any portion of the Qur'an you want, as Allah Jalla wa'ala says, فَقَرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Recite whatever is easy from the Qur'an. We say in response to this that the Sunnah explains the Qur'an, and if the Sunnah explains to us that Al-Fatiha is an obligation, then we need to take that. Because the Prophet has come to explain to us the Qur'an so that we may understand it properly. Allah Jalla wa'ala himself says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَةِ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ We have sent down to you the reminder, meaning the Qur'an, that you may explain to the people what has been revealed to them, and that they may ponder. Hadith 204 from Abu Huraira. He says that the Prophet والسلام, entered the masjid and another man entered also. And he came to the Prophet and said the salam and the Prophet replied the salam and told the man, Irji' fa salli fa inna kalam tu salli. Return and pray because you have not prayed. And so the man returned, prayed, he came back, said the salam, the Prophet returned the salam by saying, Wa alayka salam and upon you be the salam. But he said the same thing again. Return, pray, because you have not prayed. So the man returned and he prayed and he came back and he said the salam. And the same process happened to a total of three times. And the man then said, By the one who has sent you with the truth, I cannot do any better than this. Teach me. And so the Prophet then told him, 
إذا قمت إلى الصلاة فكبر When you stand up for the prayer then make the takbir ثم اقرأ ما تيسر معك من القرآن Then recite whatever is easy for you from the Quran ثم اركع حتى تطمئن راكعا Then make a ruku' until you are steady and in tranquility in the ruku' ثم ارفع حتى تعتدل قائما Then raise yourself until you are standing straight ثم اسجد حتى تطمئن ساجدا Then make the sajda until you are in tranquility in the sajda ثم ارفع حتى تطمئن جالسا Then raise yourself until you are sitting down in tranquility and steadiness ثم افعل ذلك في صلاتك كلها And then do all of this in the whole of your prayer So we find then that the mistake this person was making was that he was praying but he did not have tham'anina which is the tranquility in your actions and this is a rukun of the prayer because the Prophet told him to repeat the prayer and that can only happen when you missed out on a rukun of the prayer so oftentimes you see people in between the two sujood, the sitting position they don't even spend half a second and they immediately move to the next second sajda and this is a big big glaring mistake on their part because they are missing out on the Tum Anina and their prayer would be invalid if they knew what the ruling was. And this is why the Prophet told him to pray again. Notice the Prophet did not tell him to repeat the prayers he previously prayed, like yesterday and the day before and so on, because that would have also been invalid. And the reason why the Prophet did not tell him this is because the man was ignorant of the ruling of the Sharia. And so like this, if you are ignorant of the Shari'i ruling, then you don't have to repeat that action again. For example, Ammar ibn Yasir, when he wanted to make the tayammum, he rolled around in the dust. Of course, this is completely invalid, this is not how he performed the tayammum. But this is what he thought, he was ignorant of the ruling. And so the Prophet did not tell him to repeat that prayer, when the Prophet knew of what he did. Rather, the Prophet just told him how to make tayammum, and then in the future, Ammar would do it in the way the Prophet did it. A question which arises here, why didn't the Prophet just tell him how to pray properly the first time round? Why did it need to come to three attempts. The reason for this is that after three attempts, if the Prophet teaches him, this would stick with the man more effectively because he's made the mistakes three times, then when he learns after that, the correct teaching would have much more of an impact on him so that the correct teaching is more emphasized with him as opposed to teaching him the first time round. Because we all know that you learn from your mistakes. So when you do something wrong, then you learn what is right you know the right from the wrong you did. But if you do the wrong three times and then you learn what is right, this will have much more of an effect. Similar to how the Sahaba went into the Ihram state wanting to perform the Hajj, not the Umrah. And then the Prophet told them to change your intention to performing the Umrah and not the Hajj. And so this decision then would have much more of an impact on the companions than if he was to just tell them to enter the state of ihram for the umrah the first time round. So delaying a teaching to a later time is permissible if it would serve a valid benefit. Note also from this narration that the man came back and said the salam and the Prophet returned the salam despite the fact that they were in the same building. And so we can take from this that if you part company and then you rejoin you say the salam even if it be in the same building. Now this may seem unusual to most people, but this is exactly what happened in this narration, and we are to follow the narrations. Also take note that in other wordings of this hadith, the Prophet told him, ثُمَّ قَرَأْ بِأُمِّ الْقُرْآنِ and then recite the Surah Al-Fatiha. So Al-Fatiha is an obligation. Hadith number 205 from Imran ibn Hussain. He says that the Prophet ﷺ was leading us in the Salat al-Dhuhr or the Salat al-Asr. Then afterwards he said, أَيُّكُمْ قَرَأَ خَلْفِي بِسَبِّ حِسْمِ رَبِّكَ لَعَلَى فَقَالَ رَجْلٌ أَنَا وَلَمْ أُرِدْ بِهَا إِلَّا الْخَيْرِ قَالْ قَدْ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ بَعْضَكُمْ خَالَ جَنِيهَا The Prophet asked which one of you was reciting سَبِّ حِسْمِ رَبِّكَ لَعَلَى behind me. And a man said it was me and I only desired good. And to which the Prophet replied, I knew that somebody was competing with me in this surah. So first of all, we know that this is the Salat al-Dhuhr or Asr, and we also know that this is a silent prayer. So we learn from this then that the Ma'mum, the one praying behind the Imam, should recite silently, because if he recites aloud, then it could disturb others. 
and it would be as if the people are competing with each other in their recitation. Who can recite the loudest? And this is not the point. The point is that you should recite in a low voice to yourself. The question is, what is the Prophet forbidding here? Is he forbidding the recital, or is he forbidding the person from reciting out aloud? Because some people may use this hadith as evidence that you don't recite behind the Imam, even in a silent prayer. And they would interpret it as the Prophet prohibiting the recital, not the fact that he was reciting out aloud. But the weightier opinion is that you do recite behind the Imam when he's not reciting out aloud, because the Salah is never just you performing the action and keeping quiet. Rather, the Salah is action and recital. Therefore, you do recite behind the Imam. But what the Prophet is forbidding here is you don't do it out aloud. Notice the man says that I only wanted good. That's fine. He wanted good and his intention was nice and sound. However, the Prophet still did not approve of his action because if an action is against the Sunnah, it's against the Sunnah and there is no goodness in it, even if you desire goodness. And this could be said against many people who desire goodness, but their actions are wrong. For example, people celebrating the Prophet's birthday, they certainly desire goodness. And they certainly love the Prophet, without a doubt. But just because they have a great intention and desire goodness, we cannot approve of their action. Why? Because their action is not in accordance with the Sunnah, rather, it is in accordance with Bid'ah. Hadith 206, the statement of Anas radiallahu anhu. He says, I prayed with the Prophet والسلام, and Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and I never heard them recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We learn from this narration that the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, though it is recited in the Salah before the Surah Al-Fatiha, it is not recited out aloud. And this is the correct opinion, that firstly the Basmalah is not part of Al-Fatiha, as we found in the Hadith of Abu Hurairah, when he says the Fatiha line by line and he says what Allah Jalla wa ala responds with for each line. So you'll notice that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is not part of Al-Fatiha. Rather the first line of Al-Fatiha is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. However, the Basmallah is recited but not out aloud. In another narration of this same chapter, it says that Umar ibn al-Khattab used to recite this dhikr out aloud. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik and this is a dua al-istiftah you can say in the salah. It is to be said silently, not out aloud. But Umar radiallahu an would have been saying this out aloud to teach others. Otherwise, when you're saying it, you say it silently. Hadith 207 from Anas, he says that the Prophet was with us and he fainted. And then he raised his head and was smiling. And we asked, what made you laugh? And he replied, Unzilat alayya anifan suratan. Just now, a surah was revealed to me, or sent down to me. And then he recited, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Inna a'atainaka al kawthar, Fasalli li rabbika wanhar inna shani'aka huwa al abatar. And of course, this is the surah al kawthar. And then the Prophet asked, Atadruna mal kawthar? Do you know what is the kawthar? We said, Allah and His Messenger know better. He replied, فَإِنَّهُ نَهْرٌ وَعَدَنِيهِ رَبِّي عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَلَيْهِ خَيْرٌ كَثِيرٌ He said, this kawthar is a river which my Lord Azza wa Jal has promised me. And in this river there is much goodness. هُوَ حَوْضٌ تَرِدُ عَلَيْهِ أُمَّةِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ It is a basin which my Ummah will come to on يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ آنِيَتُهُ عَدَدُ نُجُومِ السَّمَاءِ It's cups from which you drink would be like the number of the stars in the sky. فَيَخْتَلِجُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْهُمْ But from this ummah, a servant will be taken away or pulled away so that he will not be able to drink from the hawl. فَأَقُولُ رَبِّ إِنَّهُ مِنْ أُمَّتِي I would say, my Lord, he is from my ummah. فَيَقُولُ مَا تَذْرِي مَا أَحْدَثَتْ بَعْدَكْ You do not know what this ummah or this people innovated after you. Firstly, this narration is used by those people who say that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is at the beginning of every surah and it is part of it. Because before reciting al-Kawthar, the Prophet recited Bismillah. But the correct opinion is that the Basmalah is not part of any surah, but rather it is from the etiquette that it should be recited before you begin the surah. Except for Surah At-Tawbah, there is a consensus on that issue. And the evidence that Basmalah is not part of the surah 
is the authentic hadith in the Sunan, the Prophet saying, Suratun Thalathuna Ayah, Tashfa'u li sahibiha hatta yughfara lah, Tabaraka alladhi biyadihi al-mulk. He says that there is a surah of 30 ayat, it would intercede for its companion until he is forgiven. And this surah is Tabaraka alladhi biyadihi al-mulk, meaning Surah al-mulk. Now if you look, Surah al-mulk has 30 ayat, not including the basmala. There are also many fawaid pertaining to aqidah in this narration. From the aqidah is al hawd the basin which will be put up on the plains of Yawm al-Qiyamah. And in this basin, there will be water from al kawthar poured in, from which the ummah will be able to drink except for those who were the munafiqeen, who outwardly displayed their Islam, but inwardly they were kuffar. They will be taken away from the hawd and their nifaq would become apparent. As Allah says about Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Yawm Tubla Sarair, the day when the secrets will be revealed. So it will be revealed who the true believer is and who the munafiq is. So no one will be able to hide the inner secrets and the inner convictions. The river of al gawthar has been described as whiter than milk, sweeter than honey, and smelling better than misk. And we find in this narration, its cups, which you will use to drink from, meaning from the hawd, they are more than the number of the stars in the sky. So it really is uncountable. Take note also in this narration the Prophet smiles and this would be his laugh. His laughing would be smiling. He would not do more than smiling. Take note also that the ayah talks about al kawthar but the ayah does not explain what al kawthar is. It is only the hadith which explains to us that the kawthar is a river in Jannah which the Prophet has been given. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we absolutely need the ahadith to explain the Qur'an to us. And that the Qur'an by itself is not good enough. Otherwise we could have all sorts of various opinions about what the word means and we would have no agreement and no one to judge between us. Hadith 208 from Wa'il ibn Hujr. He says, I saw the Prophet ﷺ raise his hands when he began the prayer. He would make the takbir and then he would wrap his clothes around him and then he would place his right hand over his left hand and when he wanted to make the ruku' he would take his hands out from his clothes and then he would raise them and then he would make the takbir and go into ruku' and when he said sami allahu liman hamida he raised his hands and when he made sajda he made sajda between his palms so that his hands were between his head so we learn a few things from this narration about how to pray, but the main point we want to focus on is where you place the hands. We know you raise your hands and then you make the takbir, but where do you put your hands? Well, it tells us that you put the right over the left, but it doesn't tell us where you put that. There is a narration, even though it may be weak, it tells us that you put the right over the left on the chest, because the word sadr is used, which means a chest, and this is not in the sahih, it is another narration, and its authenticity is questionable. But it seems to be the most authentic thing we have on the Salah with regards to where you place your hands. It should be on the chest. Other narrations also talk about beneath the belly button, but they are weak. Hadith 209 from Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he says, We used to say in the Salah behind the Prophet, As-salamu ala Allah, as-salamu ala fulan. Salam be upon Allah, salam be upon such and such a person. And so the Prophet told us one day, Inna Allah hu as-salam. فَإِذَا قَعَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيَقُلْ أَتَّحِيَاتُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَوَاتُ وَالطَّيَّبَاتُ السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين فإذا قالها أصابت كل عبد لله صالح في السماء والأرض أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم يتخير من المسألة ما شاء the Prophet told them, Allah is a salam So when one of you sits in his prayer, then let him say this, at tahiyah And that's the dhikr which he mentioned in the narration. And he said that when one of you says this, then he sends the salam on every righteous slave in the heavens and the earth. Then after that, let him choose whatever he wants from the dua. So he can ask for whatever he wants. So we find in this narration, an order has been given to say the tashahud. And this is wajib in the prayer. As for saying, As-salamu alayka ayyuhun nabiyyu, peace be upon you, O Prophet, then this is not because the Prophet is present with you, but rather, it is as if the Prophet was present with you. So you're feeling as if the Prophet is present with you, and so this is why you're directing your speech as if he was in front of you.
and so salam be upon the Prophet both in this world and in the hereafter, both in his barzakh and in the akhirah, but also the salam on his sunnah as well, which he left behind. We learn from this narration that if somebody is doing something wrong, then even if he has good intentions, still he should be corrected because the people used to say assalamu ala Allah, assalamu ala fulan, and this is wrong, even though the companions had good intentions, but the Prophet still corrected them and gave them the alternative. So when you make something haram for someone, then give him a halal alternative. We can also take a valuable rule from Usul al-Fiqh in this narration, because when you say in the At-Tahiyyah, Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillah salihin Assalam be upon us and on the righteous servants. Then the Prophet took this generally. He said that this means that you're sending the salam on every righteous servant in the heavens and the earth. Which means when we come across a text in the Sharia which is general, then we take it on the generality. So it includes everything in its generality unless you have evidence otherwise. We also learn that after the tashahud is the place for dua. And this could be any dua you want to make. Of course, it is best to make a dua which is reported from the Prophet. These are always the best adi'ya. However, you can make any dua that you want to. And also in any language you want to because this is a place of dua and a dua is not restricted to a particular language. Also, we learn that the place of dua is in the salah, not out of the salah. So you don't make dua after the salam, rather you make the dua before the salam. Because when you're in the prayer, you're in a sacred state. And it is more fitting that your du'a be answered in this sacred state. As for after the salah, then this is the place of dhikr. As Allah says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمُ الصَّلَاةَ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِكُمْ When you have finished the salah, then remember Allah, standing, sitting down, and on your sides. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, through his ishtihad, would not say, Assalamu alayka ayyuhal nabiyyu. Peace be upon you, O Prophet, because the Prophet was dead, and you cannot address a person who is not present. So he changed the style, but that was his ishtihad. Rather, we say that we are going to recite this as the Prophet taught us, without deviating. In another version from Abdullah ibn Abbas, he reports that you say it, At-tahiyyatul mubarakatul salawatul tayyibatul lillahi. Assalamu alayka ayyuhal nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. So you can see the slight difference of wordings, and both of them are correct. So you can say either one or the other, but you don't say both at the same time. That's what you do not do. Notice in the hadith, the Prophet said that when one of you sits in the prayer, this is not just any old sitting; it's the sitting for the tashahud. So it is not the sitting in between the sajda, for example. As for the ruling of a tashahud, then the First tashahud, meaning after two raka'at, is wajib in a three or four raka'at salah. And as for the last tashahud, meaning the one immediately before the salam, then that is a rukun according to the madhab of Imam Ahmad. Hadith 210 from Ka'ab ibn Ujra. He said, we asked the Prophet, we know how to give the salam upon you, but how do we make the salah upon you? And so the Prophet replied, قولوا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. Then this narration they are asking how to send the salah upon the Prophet as Allah commands us in the Quran صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما send your salah upon him and the taslim. So the method is given to us, but the question is. Is this an obligation in the prayer or not? And there's a difference of opinion on this issue. The majority scholars say that it is mustahab. If you left it out, your prayer is still correct. Other scholars like Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad, they said that it is wajib. And you are not allowed to leave it out in the last tashahud on purpose. The reason why the majority say it is sunnah because there's no authentic narration telling us that you say this dhikr in the salah. However, Al-Hakim has reported a narration in which there are some added wording which talk about the salah. So the Prophet is asked, كَيْفَ نُصَلِّ عَلَيْكَ إِذَا نَحْنُ صَلَّيْنَا عَلَيْكَ فِي صَلَاتِنَا How do we send the salah upon you when we want to do it in our salah? And then the Prophet goes on to explain that you have to say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad up until the end of it. So if this narration is authentic, then the matter is clear-cut. We have to go by it. But we say that in any case, you have nothing to lose. 
you should say this after your tashahud. So what we learn is that you have to say, Oh Allah, send your salah upon the Prophet, like you did upon the followers of Ibrahim. And this is making tawassul to Allah using the sunnah of Allah. So it's like saying, Oh Allah, because it is your sunnah that you send your salah upon Ibrahim and his followers, then use this sunnah and continue it on to the last Prophet and his followers as well. As in the hadith with the dua, Allahumma kama hassan khalqi fahassin khuluqi. Oh Allah, like you made my physical creation good, so also make my character good. So it's like saying, Oh Allah, continue on your sunnah to my character also. What's the ruling on sending the salah to other than a prophet? Well, we say if it is in following a prophet, then it is permissible. So you send your salah on the prophet and you name a person after the prophet. So that person is in following the prophet, so that's okay. As for individually, then it can be said for a particular reason, but it should not be taken as a regular practice. For example, the Prophet said when one of the companions, Abu Awfa, gave his zakah to the Prophet, he said, Allahumma salli ala Ali Abi Awfa. Oh Allah, send your salah upon the family of Abu Awfa. So this can be said to a non-Prophet, however, it should be due to a particular reason, such as him giving you the zakah, and it should not be taken as a regular habitual practice. As for the Salah of Allah Jalla wa ala on the Prophet, then this is simply Allah mentioning the Prophet with praise amongst the Malaika. Okay, here's a question. Is it wajib to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Prophet whenever he's mentioned? Some people say you have to do it whenever he's mentioned. Others say you just need to do it once if he's mentioned in one gathering. But the safest opinion is to mention it every time he is mentioned. And there is plenty of evidence for this. For example, authentically in the Sunan him saying, Al-Bakhilu man dhukirtu andahu falam yusalli alayya. The stingy one is the one where when I am mentioned, he does not send the salah upon me. Likewise, the Prophet saying, Raghima anfu rajulin dhukirtu andahu falam yusalli alayya. Wa raghima anfu rajulin dakhla alayhi ramadan thumman salakha qabla in yughfara lah. وَرَغِمَ أَنْفُ رَجُلٍ أَدْرَكَ أَبَوَاهُ الْكِبَرِ أَحْدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَمْ يُدْخِلَاهُ الْجَنَّةِ He's saying, may the one be humiliated, who when I am mentioned, he does not send the salah upon me, and the one who experiences Ramadan, and yet still he is not forgiven by the end of it, and the one who has two elderly parents, or even one of them, and they do not enter him into Jannah. Meaning to say because he did not look after them well and treat them right. There is a similar hadith about the Prophet stepping up the mimbar three steps saying Ameen each time. And that hadith gives the same information as the last one. And then there are others besides. So the safest option is to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every time he is mentioned. Even if it does inconvenience you. As for the ruling on saying the Salah on the Prophet in the last tashahud. Then most scholars say it is Sunnah. And others like Ibn Qayyim say it is wajib. For all practical purposes, you should not worry about whether it is mustahab or wajib. You should just do it. And also note, as for some people saying, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Then the word Sayyidina is not authentic from any narration. Therefore it is a bid'ah and must be avoided. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. Explain what we mean by at tarji'. Question number two. Why is the Quran called the mother of the book? Question number three. Is the basmala part of the surah of the Quran at the beginning? Explain your answer.